recording right now. All right, so I think I got everything working. And the first thing is I'm going to go over the homework assignment. And where, that, where is that? Okay, let me do this first. And look up my 440 canvas shell. There we go. All right, I know that's just the syllabus, but we are on the right page. Nope, we are not. Okay, where did that one go? Right, okay, I got it. All right, there we go. Okay, first thing first, you know, homework assignments. So I'm going to go over the homework assignments, which are related to your exam next week, next Wednesday. So we will start with that, and then we'll proceed to talk about the practice uh, questions. All right, so we are doing the function assignment. So this is the first one that we are going to deal with. So my question may not be the same as yours, because they are really kind of randomized. But I'm going to show you guys how to answer those questions. All right, so in this case, you know, it says, <clears throat> this is your specific function, and I want to know whether this really is a function or not. What do you think? Is this actually a function? Yep, it is, because everything in the domain maps to one and only one thing in the codomain. Very good. Um, so we have one. Um, should we add two to it, because is it injective? It is not injective because zero maps to one, one maps to one also. So the elements from the domain do not map to unique elements in the codomain. So it is not um, injective. And because we have the same number of elements in the codomain as there are elements in the domain, and we already know we already know it is not injective, which basically makes it not surjective either. So in this case, you know, one is the correct answer. Next. All right, so they're all about the same, okay, in the form, in terms of format, but some have four elements in the codomain. So in this case, let's see, is it a function? Yes, it is a function. Is it an injection? It is not injective because we have zero mapped to zero and two also maps to zero. Makes it, that makes it not injective. But this time, because it has four elements in the codomain and only three elements in the domain, which automatically makes it not surjective. There's, there's no possibility whatsoever to use all the elements in the codomain. So once again, it is just a function, but it is not injective, nor is it surjective. All right, moving on. All right, so with this one, we have zero map to one, one map to one, two map to two. It is a function, but it is not an injection because we have zero and one both mapping to one. It is also not surjection because you know, zero is not mapped to. So once again, one is the correct answer here. So you might end up with multiple of these questions ending up with exactly the same value. That can happen. All right, with this one, it is definitely not uh, the same thing, just a one, because it is a function, because we can see zero, one, and two are all mapped to something in the codomain, but we can also see you know, two of them mapped to one and one of them mapped to two, so it is also just a one, which means it is a function, but it is not injective nor surjective. Um, this is question number five. Um, same, you have know, one. And here's number six. Oh, this one is definitely a one. Everything maps to one. Okay. And here comes the last one. Okay, one, two, three. Okay, so this one is an injection, but it's not a surjection because there are more elements in the codomain than there are elements in the domain. Uh, zero maps to two, one maps to three, two maps to zero. So it is a function, it is an injection, but not a surjection. So we have to put a three here because it is a function. So submit quiz. And how many points am I getting? So I'm getting seven points. Is that kind of the total? Yep, seven out of seven. So I got every single one of these correct. 
So do we have any questions about this assignment? Nope. Okay. All right. So moving on to the next homework assignment. Yes. <laughs> so, if, if a set of uh, elements has like 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, that means it's not an element. That is correct, because there are two things. Okay, it's really one thing, but you can look at it as two different things. If there are elements in the domain that, that do not map to anything in the codomain, it is not a function. If there are two elements in the domain mapping to whatever in the codomain, it is also not a function. So that means you, know, you, you can only map one element in the domain to one and only one thing in the codomain. It cannot be mapped to two different things in the codomain. Yep. All right, any other questions? Yep. Okay, so if you have a 2-2 two, two and a 2-2, two, two, it's almost guaranteed that that is not a function because something is not mapped from the domain. So you know, not counting whether that's a valid you know, set or not, you know, it is definitely not a function because uh, there are only three tuples in each you know, set. So if two is taking up two slots, that means you know, one of the elements in the domain is not mentioned in that set. So it's definitely not a function in that case. Um, well, the set that we use you know, are not supposed to have duplicate elements. So you know, that would not be a, a set to begin with. <coughs> All right, any other questions? Yep. You can still list those as members, but they count as one. Okay. So all the duplicate elements are count on, count only as one. That is correct. Yep. Unless those two map the same element in the domain to two different things in the codomain, but that would not have caused the issue of whether it's a set or not because those would be considered two distinct two tuples. All right, pretty good. Any other questions? Okay, so we're gonna go to the next homework assignment, which is on uh, mapping. So that's also a kind of interesting one, space folding. And we'll take a look. All right, so the first question is, given the cell has a coordinate of you know, 26, 27, what is the natural number that this coordinate maps to using the G function that was discussed in lectures? Um, you just have to kind of put it in. Um, I can do it on the side. Let me open up a window to do that. Okay. And put it into view here. <clears throat> so we have 26, right? 26 plus 27 times 26 plus 27 plus one, the whole thing divided by two plus 27, which is the Y coordinate. So in this case, it should be 1,458. So one, four, five, eight, okay. The reverse is harder, you know, because you have to remember how to apply the W function, but you know, we can, when we get to it, we get to it. All right, so this is the fun function. This is the fun one, you know, because it's asking how many ways can we um, apply G in a nested way so that we can fold a three-dimensional space into a one-dimensional space. And it is my, this is my bad. I was using, I shouldn't have been, I should not have used you know, X here. I should have used N here and not X because, you know, that implies you know, this has to be the same value as that one. So that, that is my fault. <clears throat> But the correct answer is um, there are 12 ways to do it. Because if you think about how many ways can you arrange X, Y, and Z, 
Now, I know we have not talked about combination or permutation yet in this class, but with three, I think most people can figure it out. Okay, you only got three things. How many ways can we order those three things? So there are six ways to do it. But how can we get, come up with twelve? Because you can nest the second two, the first two, like this, or you can nest the second two. So that provides you a, a, multipl a multiplication factor of two. So two times six is twelve in this case. So there are twelve ways to generate these functions. And by the way, this particular one,、uh, this entire quiz, you have five attempts. So it's not it's not just one; you have five attempts. And the last one is harder, okay? Because you know, you actually have to do the square root thing,、um, so you have to kind of figure that out you know, by yourself.、Um, but the point is, it is in the module, okay? The inverse function is listed in the module, so it's just a matter of plugging in these values into the quadratic equation, and then you know, just you know, try to figure that out. All right. So, do we have any questions about all of this stuff? Nope. Okay, so I'm gonna leave this one blank, you know, because I cannot remember the inverse function myself. Which brings us to the exam. Okay, how are you? Are you ready for the exam? I mean, or will you be ready, you know, for the exam next Wednesday? Okay, so we'll find out. Okay, because what we're gonna do is we will take a look at the questions from last semester, and then we'll work those out. So for you, if you want to go back to that question, you go to the announcement, and then you go all the way to exam one. There's an attachment there. You can open up the PDF so you can actually look at the questions on the side as I talk about the solution. And you can also also open up a separate tab if you have a laptop computer of ChatGPT's answer to question number one because I am actually quite、uh, intrigued. By Chat and GPT, and how it was able to answer the question. So, <clears throat> what I did was I copied the markdown version of the questions, which is actually how it was generated. It, it's all generated as a markdown document. So I fed the markdown version of the questions directly into Chat and GPT without any you know, massaging, and it was able to figure out every single one. So we'll double check. Okay, we're going to go between you know, our answers, you know, that we are going to do by hand, versus the answer from ChatGPT, and see whether ChatGPT makes any mistakes in this case or not. Okay. So before we move on, are there any questions about exam one? Okay, I don't see any questions. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about that, and I'm going to maximize the screen. And use my tablet here. Okay, so I printed the same document just in a different way that gives me some extra space on the right hand side, so I can you know handwrite stuff on the right hand side. All right. So the question is: A is you know A has four elements. In this case, a K D M A.、Uh, B has four elements, which are D M C Q, and then C has three elements, which are Q B and A. So those are given to you. Do not change those things. Furthermore, you are also given that f zero is a function. A is the domain. B is the codomain of f zero, and the exact mapping of f zero is given over here. Okay. So f zero is actually already defined. We also have another function called f one. F one uses B as the domain, C as the codomain, and the exact mapping of f one is also given here. In its definition, so those are all the given stuff that you start with. So the question starts with certain, you know, kind of really easy operators、uh, related to set operations. The first one is finding the difference between two sets. So a minus c would be a set with every element in a but not in b. So we look at、uh, set a; it has k, d, m, a. We look at set c; it has q, b, and a. So the only overlap. Is element A itself, so that means you know, the answer to part one is going to be everything in A except for A. So we have K, D, and M. Are we doing okay so far with the first part? Okay, it's only worth five percent of the entire question because it is well. I consider this more or less as a warm up. 
Okay, the second one is the union, which means you know the elements. So this particular set contains elements that can be found in at least one of A or C. So we can always start with everything in A. So K, D, M, A. And then we look into set C and ask, so what are in C but not in A? Because we also want to include those over here. So that would be Q and B. So this is the union between the set A and also the set C. And then the third question is looking for the intersection, which is looking for elements that are in both sets. So we can see that you know, we already determined earlier that element A is the only one that is in A, the set A, and also in the set C. So that means you know, the intersection only has one single element in it, which is A, lowercase a. Do we have any questions about parts one, two, three? Okay, no questions. All right, so we move on to something that's a little bit more hairy now, which is you know, part five. So part five is asking, what is the value of the following expression? And a certain part is underlined because you know, it is important to answer depending on you know, what the answer is. All right, so we're going to go, we, we'll try to answer the question first, okay? What is the value of this entire expression? So what do you think? Okay, first of all, how do we interpret that? What is it saying? It's saying for elements x, y in A, there exists element x, y in A, there exists element z in C, such that <clears throat> x does not equal to y, and x, z is in F2, and y, z is in F2. Okay, so what are you going to do to figure that part out? So can you find me a single instance, okay? Find me your two elements, x, y. Okay, I take it back because x, y can be the same thing. So find me values of the variable x, y. They have to be coming from A. Find me one particular value in C, we call it Z, such that x and y are different. Uh, x, z is in F2, and y, z is also in F2. So without knowing anything about functions, this is a question about the notation of quantifiers, the notation of how we deal with sets, and also you know, just looking for specific two tuples in this case. So I don't know the answer. That's, we have to work it out. So we look at uh, set A. It has KDMA. Uh, we are looking for two different elements, X and Y. And we are looking at X, uh, mapping to Z and Y also mapping to Z in function F2. So, oh, I skipped one part, didn't I? Because <laughs> I, I was looking at this and going like, but what is, where's F2? Okay, so we have to figure out F2 first. All right. Do we have any questions about what F2 is? Because I can just give you the answer. It, it doesn't ask you for an explanation. So are there any questions about how we figure out F2? Or are there any questions about the nested application of functions? Yes or no? Are we good? Okay. So I'm just going to give you the solution and then see if you guys have any questions about that. So for question for part four, F2 is a set. And we are mapping... MQ, QQ, so MQ is here. AC, CA, so AA. DD, and then DB, so DB is here. And then finally, we have KM, MQ, so KQ is here. All right, so I'm going to pause here to see if there are any questions. The question can be in the form of, I have no idea how you come up with F2. <laughs> okay, so the way we do this is we look at every element of A first, and then we apply F0 to it. In other words, we just spell it out, okay? So in your mind, you can just say F0 of 
whatever is in the domain A, let's say we start with K. What is that? It would be M. Yep, that's correct. So what is F1 of M? Okay. So that means F0 of K and then F1 of whatever that is is also Q, right? So that means F2 of K is Q, right? And that also means your K maps to Q. So this tuple has to be in F2. That's it. Just go through every element in the domain of F0, do the same thing, and add a two tuple to F2 for each element in the set A, and you're done. Okay? All right. Are there any other questions? Is this explanation sufficient? Okay, so we know how to do this. All right. All right, so now that we have F2, we can answer the question of part five of this entire thing. So it's basically asking, are there two things in A that map to the same thing in C? That's basically what it's asking. So now we look at F2, and we can see that M and K both map to Q. So that means you know, for part five, the answer is true. So that's the first answer to part five is it is true. The expression is true. But the question also says, if the answer is true, specify an example of X, Y, and Z such that the underlined expression is true, and that's why a certain part is underlined. In other words, give me specific examples because this is existential quantifier, um, and it is true, so that means I should be able to identify exactly what X, Y, and Z should be. So in this case, uh, we just identify that. X is M, Y is K, and then Z is Q. Now, someone is going to ask me, you know, well, what about, you know, X is K and Y is M? We just, you know, do the uh, com commutation, right? You know, we just exchange the order. That's fine. Not a problem. Is that okay for part five? Okay. So what I wrote here is sufficient as the answer to get all the points. Okay, part six. Okay, part six has a different uh, quantified expression. What is the value of blah, blah, blah? Okay, so once again, you have to know what it means. It says for all y in C, which means if you look at every element in the set C, we want you know, this whole thing to be true. That thing turns out to be there exists x in A such that x, y is in F2. Okay, so if you want to do this programmatically, okay, what you're going to do is you write, a, you write two loops, okay, a double loop. The first loop, loop through everything in C, and the variable holding the element is going to be Y. For each iteration of that outer loop, you write an inner loop. The inner loop is going to go through every element in A, and the variable holding the each element or you know, instantiated each element is called X. But you can exit this loop early if you can find X, Y is in F2. Is that okay? So I, I will give you a view you know, that is based on what I just said, okay, the, from the programmatic perspective. Um, yeah, I can do that, and I can, I can just erase that later. So we look at everything in C. C has you know, three elements, Q, B, and A. Okay? So that's the outer loop where, you know, okay, so I'm going to make this a little bit more complete. Why is this? Why is this? Why is this? So this is representing three iterations of the outer loop. And, you know, for each outer loop, it has to come out as true, okay? Because, you know, this is a universal quantifier right there, okay? Now we look at the inner loop. The inner loop is to go to iterate through everything in uh, the set A, which has KDMA. So we basically instantiate X to K and then D and then uh, M and then A in sequence. Okay, you know, this is a notation. I'm just using this so that I don't have to use more space on the screen. So in the first iteration of the inner loop, X becomes K. In the second iteration, K becomes D. In the next iteration, K becomes M. And in the last iteration, K becomes A. The question is, can I find 
at least one of the things like QK, is it in the set F2? QD, is it in the set? QM, is it in the set? QA, is it in the set? So you tell me. We know what F2 is. So you look at the Q stuff. Okay, and did I reverse the order? Yep, I reversed the order. So we're looking for KQ or DQ or MQ or AQ. Sorry, I reversed the order because you know, we are looking for the tuple where X is the first item and Y is the second item. So we are looking for KQ, DQ, MQ, or AQ. Does at least one of those exist as an element in K2? So I'm looking at Q2, K2 right now, and we're looking for blah Q. So we have MQ, yep. And we also have KQ, okay? So we got two hits, which means, okay, it's certainly true, okay? This is true. Now we move on to the second iteration, you know, where you know, we go through the same loop for X, K, D, M, A. So we are now looking for the two tuple KB, DB, MB, or AB. We only have, we only need at least one of those to exist. So now we look at F2, and we, we are looking for uh, something that ends with a B. Yep, we got DB here, okay, DB. So that means at least one exists, we're good here. Is that okay? And then now we look at uh, something A, okay, same thing. So K, D, M, A. <clears throat> and we want something that ends with A. Eh, we got one, okay, we got A, A here. And A is one of the value in X. Uh, I apologize for the bad penmanship here. That looks like a Q. So we have AA here. So Q, you know, when Y equals to A, we find at least one two tuple that goes from one element of A to an element of C. So it is all checked, which means the for all is checking two. So that means in part six, the answer is also true. And in part six, it says, if the answer is false, specify an example, blah, 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 which means when it's true, I don't have anything else to do. Yeah, so we are done here. Do we have any questions about um, this part here where I'm just kind of programmatically trying to figure out, you know, how to evaluate the nested quantified expression? Yes? Nope, nope, nope. That's not what the question asks. The question asks if it is false, specify an example of why such that the underlying expression is false. You just have to give me a single instance and say when y equals to blah, the underlying expression is false. That's all it's asking. So read the question carefully because it's already specified in the question. All right, so moving on to what, part seven? So part seven has yet another <clears throat> different quantified expression, which is this one here. And this one looks a little bit more complicated. Okay, so let's go ahead and read it. But this time, I don't, I don't think I'm gonna do it in that particular way. For all X in A, in other words, for every element X in the set A, for every element Y in set C, we, on, we want to evaluate whether x, y is in F2, if and only if y, x is in F3. Um, oh, we have to define F3 such that that is true. Okay, so what do you think it's trying to do? What do you think F3 is going to look like in order to make that quantified expression in part eight, no, part seven to be true? So I'm going to erase something here because otherwise I'm I would be out of room. So there we go. Okay. So now we can look at F3 in question number seven. So F3 is going to have what? 
Okay, so let's read this again. For every element in x in A, for every element y in C, x, y is in F2, if and only if y, x is in F3. We know what F2 is already. We want to derive F3 to make this you know, statement true. So I'm not asking whether it's true or not. I'm trying to say make an F3 so that that statement is true. Okay, so that means we're reversing every tuple in F2 and make that an element in F3. So now we have, you know, we have QM, which is the reverse of MQ. Uh, AA reversed is still AA, not a problem there. We have BD because that's the reverse of DB. And then finally we have um, Q, okay, is it KQ or KA? I think it's a KQ. So it becomes QK. There we go. All right. That's it. That's for F3. All right. So I'm going to pause here and see what you guys have to say or, you know, whether there are any additional questions about the notations. Because, you know, I intentionally use expressions that you have not seen before by recombining the quantified expression, the element of the conjunction and disjunction to test whether you understand the notation or not. So how many people feel comfortable with the notations and how many people feel not so comfortable with the notations and what to do about it, okay? You know, because I don't want to just give people the anxiety of, oh man, I'm gonna do bad in this test. That is not the intention. The intention is to find out that, hmm, I might need to do something about it and know what to do about it before the exam. Okay, so what I, so let's just assume that I don't feel comfortable. Okay, you know, I can read these notations. I know what each one is, but I don't know exactly together what they mean. What resources do I have to study for this test? Exactly. <laughs> Most people think you, know, you must be kidding me. No, I am not kidding you. Okay, so I am going to switch back to uh, the earlier page here. Um, so, okay, I have to use the right keyboard. There we go. So if you are to look at the answers that we got, I, I have my answer right here so I can actually compare. So for the first part, KDM is correct. For the second part, KDMA, CQB, wait, 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 wait. Where is that C coming from? Okay. Let's go back to the question, okay? So this is also important because you know, apparently we cannot really fully trust the you know, chat and GPT because um, set A has KDMA, set C has QB and A. There's no element C whatsoever. So that means your know, chat GPT made a mistake, even though it was correct for the most part. <laughs> it's the little minute detail that gets you, okay? You know, it'll also get your know, chat and GPT. So you kind of have to be careful when you use your know, chat GPT because it really does not fully understand your know, logic or set operators. It is a, it's a LLM, okay? It's a, lang it's a large language model which means it's very, very good at figure out, figuring out patterns between words and what we call tokens, but it doesn't really understand logic. Okay, so let's go check another result here. The intersection is just A, that turns out to be correct. Um, and does it figure out F2 correctly? So I'm just comparing to my result here. Uh, K, A, Nope, DB is correct, AA is correct, MQ is correct. I think the K, the K, the KA is correct because, okay, let me, let me double check. So KM, MQ, it should be KQ, and it puts a KA here. This one is incorrect. It should have been KQ and not KA. So it made a mistake again, okay? But once again, the rest of F2 is actually correct. It got most of it right, but it got some minor things wrong. 
All right, so let's move on and check the the, uh, the next one, which is your know, number five. So for number five, you know, it is true, okay? All right, so you got it right there. And the example is when X is K, Y is D, and Z is B. What? <laughs> that doesn't, okay. So for this one, I will not only give a zero to the answer, I'm going to take points out of it, okay? It, which means it's worth negative value, okay? Because not only is it wrong, it is inconsistent with earlier parts of the question. Because based on this, it is basically saying, you know, okay, I see that K maps to B. I also see that D maps to B and so on. Um, even for the wrong answer that it has, there's only one thing mapping to B, um, which means K, B is okay. Um, excuse me, take it back. D, B is okay. Okay, we find D, B. But K does not map to B at all. K maps to A. So that means you know, the answer is not only wrong, it is also inconsistent with its own wrong answer from the earlier parts of the exam. If this was somebody turning in this, I would be looking for, um, I would be looking for <clears throat> other versions of the same test where that is actually the correct answer because you know, I would have a suspicion of somebody just copied this from somebody else where the original question is actually different because of the internal inconsistency between part, uh, part four and part five. So in other words, ChatGPT is not very good at figuring out these answers, but it seems pretty confident about it, doesn't it? All right. So if ChatGPT cannot be used in this way, what can it, how can it be used? It can probably explain, you know, the uh, notations, okay, you know, that it may be actually good at. The other thing you can also do, okay, you know, I know it's going to take some time and it's going to be um, tedious, okay, but once you do it a few times, you'll get it. <clears throat> the other way you can do is to turn everything, you know, all the, you know, the quantify expression that is in question into code, okay, just look at it as nested loops and basically say, okay, if it's a for all, I need every iteration to return a true. If it's existential, I only need at least one iteration to return a true for the whole thing to be true. So you evaluate it, you evaluate it that way, you, you go through a few examples and then you'll get it, okay? So it's about you're getting a feel of you know, what the expression means. All right, so we are done with seven. Now we move on to number eight. And it asks, what is the value of blah, 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 okay? So once again, it's a double loop. It has exactly the same structure as question number six, except instead of asking about F2, we're now asking about F3. So what it really is asking is, does everything in C map to at least one thing in A? That's what it's asking. So now we look at F3, and then we try to answer the question. So we have to look at everything in C, and set C has QBA. So does Q map to something in A? Q maps to M, and M is in A. We're good there. Um, then we look at the next element of C in C, which is B. Does B map to something in A? B, D. D is in A, so we're good there. Um, and then how about A? Does A map to something in the set A? The answer is yes, it does map to something in A. So that part is okay. So for part eight, you know, the answer is true. So we say true. And then if you read the question, it says if the answer is false, blah, 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 which means you know, in this case, I don't have to do anything because the answer is actually true. Then the next one says, you know, what is the value of da 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 da? Okay, this has the same format as I think uh, one of the earlier parts. Similar. Hmm? Similar. Yeah. Um, it's reversed a little bit here you know, because you know, this is on the outside, this one is on the inside. So it's basically asking for, um, is there at least one thing in C that maps to two different things in A in F3. That's what it's asking. 
All right? So what is the answer to that question? Is there anything in C, okay, because uh, X is from the first tuple in F3, so is there anything in C that maps to two different things in A? So we look at F3 here, and then we ask that question, okay? Uh, let's say X is Q, okay? Q maps to M and Q up maps to K. Okay, I got lucky this time <laughs> because I just answered my question, right? Because Q can be used as my X here, and then the Y is going to be the M, and then the Z is going to be my K over here. I found one way, okay, to instantiate values into X, Y, and Z such that the underlined portion is true. So, <clears throat> so that means, you know, to give the full answer here, I have to say the answer is true. And one way, at least one way to make it true is X is Q, Y is M, and then Z is K. Yep. Yes, they're commutative. Yep. They just have to be different, so you can split the order if you want. All right, so we are down to part 10. Is F3 a function such that F3 is a function where C is the domain and A is the codomain? What do you think? The answer is no. It doesn't ask for any further explanation. So no, false, you know, they're both fine as a correct answer. All right, so that's question number one. Question number two and three have exactly the same format just on different you know, instances of the sets. So do we have any questions about number one? Yep. Why it is not a function? So you have to remember what a function is, okay? To make a set of two tuples, which is a subset of the Cartesian product between the domain, the intended domain and the intended codomain, uh, the, the set has to be a subset first, right? And then two is each element in the domain has to map to one and only one element in the codomain. In this case, uh, we met one thing, you know, we, we met at least one, but not exactly one. Because we can see how Q is mapping to both M and K, which means you know, um, at least one element in the intended domain maps to two different things, which is not one and only one anymore, things in the codomain. So it's still testing you on the concepts of what a function is, you know, but not using the same expressions that we have used in class when we talked about functions. And that is intentional. Yes? In question number nine, what again? Sorry, go ahead. In question nine. Yes. It's not, F3 is not a function. Okay, I never said it is a function. It is a set of two tuples. Uh, this one is AA, that is a Q, yeah, bad penmanship. So this is a Q, oh, even worse, ah, okay, okay, so let me rewrite this, this is a Q, that's an A, this is a Q, yep, <laughs> that's, that's just an A. These two IAs. All right. Any other questions? So this means you know, your penmanship has to be reasonable. <laughs> I will try to interpret things in a good way. You know, so look for consistency instead of you know, just nitpicking people and go like, oh, this one looks like a Q to me, but the right answer is A, so I'm going to count it as a Q. <laughs> I don't do that. <clears throat> 
But if there's some anything suspicious, you know, then I will actually go hunt for evidence. So, are we good with question number one? So, moving on to, do we want to do question two and three first, or do we want to skip those two, and so that we can work on a different type of question? Mm hmm. Okay, that's a very good question. So let me repeat the question to the whole class. The question is, okay, let me go back to number one. The question is, if you answer an earlier part incorrectly, okay, does that doom everything else in the same question? So it depends. <laughs> okay, it depends. Because if I say, you know, okay, no matter what, you know, I'm going to ask, I'm looking for consistency of the later parts with the earlier parts, then some people would go like, okay, I can make, you know, a certain case so that the later parts I can answer easily. So I cannot just say that, yeah, I'm just going to look for consistency between parts, okay, because you know, that, I can personally abuse that field you know, statement to no end, okay, so that's why I cannot do that. So it means, you know, if you get an earlier part wrong, if you get a later part correct, it's going to be discounted, at least discounted. You might get partial credit, but you, it will be discounted. All right? Because I have seen people doing it, and I know, you know how to do it too. It's like, oh, I can just make, you know, one part of the question. I know it's going to be the wrong answer, but it set me up to answer all the later parts easily and correctly. So, mm, <laughs> I cannot do that. Does that answer your question? Okay. All right, moving on to the later questions. This is two, which is, has the same format. You know, it's a different case, okay? So question one, two, and three are guaranteed to have something different, you know, when you answer all the different parts, okay? Uh, that's how the questions are generated. So four is the same way, too. Okay, I'll skip to question number five here because this one is kind of the fun one. All right, so I'll read the question first. Based on the G function in the olive null module, Tech wrote a, a string encoding function to the G encode is the name of the function that encodes a null terminated array of unsigned AB integers into a single integer. The C, C++ code is defined as follows, blah, 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 blah. Okay. First of all, okay, I'll pause here. What do you think, you know, if you're answering this question, what do you think you should be doing in the exam right about now? Find, yeah. Find the definition, okay? What is function G in the Aleph null module? So that means, you know, whatever you bring with you can be, you can print my module. I don't have a problem with that, okay? You can print my module, bring it with you. You can um, handwrite your own notes, okay, you know, and bring that with you. You can type up everything, you know, nice and neat and bring that with you. But you need to know what is function G of the Aleph null module, which basically means if someone walks up to me and asks, so what is function G of the Aleph null module? My answer is going to be, well, that's part of what I'm testing you. Okay, I will literally say that. So that means you have to bring all the definitions with you. You have to identify where the definitions are, either bring the module, highlight so you can find the definitions, or you'll know, handwrite it on a separate piece of paper. Bring both, okay? You, know, you can bring your own sheets, you know, your own notes, so that for things you know, that are easier to find, you know, that would be, that's gonna be your cache, right? If you cannot, if, if there's no hit on the cache, then you go to memory. You actually go to my module. So at least you know, okay, I know it is somewhere in here. Okay, yep. From memory, the Well, I define a few other things too, you know, like uh, the mapping between integers and natural number, but that's not as important, but you still need to know those functions. So I would kind of read the entire module and kind of get all those functions down. All right, okay. 
So assuming I'm reading the uh, the later part now, assuming that unsigned char num zero sixty four is a null terminated array of a bit unsigned integers to be encoded, and g encode nums return the value of forty six thousand and fifty. What are the values of the elements of nums, you know, up to and including the last element in nums that has a value that is that can be deduced? Explain your approach and numerically solve it. Please show all steps and definitions that you utilize. Da 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 da. Okay. All right. So how do you deal with this kind of thing, this kind of question? It is in, written in C, C++, okay? It's not even object-oriented, which means, you know, people in CISP360 should be able to understand this code. Now, it is recursive, but recursion doesn't mean, you know, that, you know, it's difficult to understand. It just means that you have to look at it at, in a certain way. All right. So how do, you, how do you deal with this? I want you to basically write the reverse of G encode to decode it, right? So you have to understand what G encode is going to do first. So what is one way to make sure that, okay, I think I got it now. Uh, you first, then go ahead. So basically, understand where this is being derived from, which is, like you said, it's the G function that was listed in the alloc main nodes. Mm -hmm. And then what to do from there is, okay, it was probably looking for the opposite, so it would be the W function that gave us just like that. Same well, way. the G inverse. Yeah, G, yeah, G inverse, inverse, which makes use of the W. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yep. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> That's a quick one. Ditto. Ditto. Okay. But that doesn't really help you understand the, the G encode function because you know the, the key is to understand the G encode function. Function G is not a problem. Function G is already spelled out here, right? I mean, I even give you the entire function G. You don't have to remember function G in this particular case. So, but you do have to understand, okay, but how are things encoded in this case? So what I would do, if I were you, is I'm going to give myself an example to go through. So I'm going to say, you know, what if I have an array that has, you know, two, three, and four in the array? This is the JavaScript way of you know, declaring an array, you know, uh, that's, that's ad hoc. And of course, you know, since it's a no terminated string, so that means I cannot just do it like this. I have to kind <clears> of <throat> terminate the whole thing with a zero because the last element has to be a zero. It has to be a null character. Okay. And you know, if you want to make it shorter, that's fine too. The idea is I want to see how this code works, you know, G encode. So now I look at G encode and I say, okay, what is that gonna do? Okay, hide the sidebar. There we go, okay. So now we look into the first instance of G encode. It is, okay, so in the first, call to G encode, this is where the pointer is pointing to, because the pointer P is always pointing to the first character of a string, which means initially that's what it's pointing to. So now the question is, what is it doing here? Yep. Is it? Well, In this case, is it a null character? It is not. So that means, you know, where do I go in this you know, weird looking expression? The, la the last one, yeah, exactly. This is a ternary expression. So I hope you guys still remember ternary expression because I emphasized that I would use, I'd be using the ternary expression quite a bit. So that means we have to go for this code here, which means, you know, now I know we're doing a G of something. Now, what is the first one? It's kind of like, oh, okay, this is the recursive call. I have no idea what that is. So leave some space for it. But the second one, I know what it is. It's supposed to be a two. Is that okay? So from the first call to G encode, I know it's gonna return something like this. I just don't know what goes <laughs> in here. So now I go you know, to the second call or the, uh, the nested call you know, in the recursive call. In the recursive call, okay, when you look at here, it says you know, P plus one. What does that mean? P is a pointer. It points to the three. Yep. Okay. So that means you know in the nested call, 
we now have three, four, zero, and the pointer is pointing here. So now I go to the same code here, which is asking, am I pointing to a null character? Nope, three is not null. Um, so that means I have to do this whole thing again. So that means whatever is going into here is a G function again. I don't know what is the first thing, the first argument, but I don't know what the second argument is. It's going to be a three. Is that okay? All right, so how do we stop this thing? Okay, so when we call again, you know, the pointer is going to be four. Okay, it's going to be pointing to here. So that means in this case, I would um, I go through the same logic here. Um, it's not a null, you know, it's not pointing to a null character, and I have another G function here. So whatever this is, it's going to be a G function. And I know the four is going to be here. Is that okay? Um, but it's going to be a G encode again, but this time, <clears throat> when I call it, I think, call it again, the pointer is going to be pointing to the null character. And if I have a null pointer, it does not do the G function anymore, it just returns a zero. So that means this is going to be a zero here. That's how things are nested. Which means, in this case, with an array of two, three, four, zero, what the whole thing is going to return is G of, G of, G of, okay, one, two, three, yep, zero, four, comma, three, comma, two. That's what it's going to return. Is that okay? All right, now you probably don't need to have three elements in the array because by the time you get to the second element, you probably figure out the order already. So the question is, if I get n out of this, I don't even care what n is in this case, and I need to extract you know, the two, three, four, zero you know, back out, how do I do that? I apply g inverse, right? So you basically apply g inverse, okay? So g inverse n is gonna give you what? It will give you, okay, we'll just call this m here. This is going to give you M and two. The second item is going into the array first. All right. Then you look at M and you say, okay, if M is zero, I'm done because you know, that's the null terminator and we're good. But what if M is not null? Well, if M is not null, we applied G inverse to M again. And this time we end up with, let's say P and three, because that's what M is. Because M is actually this entire thing, so when you apply G inverse to it, you get the three back out. So the three goes to the second item in the array that we are populating. And then this P, if it is not null, then we will apply G inverse again. And this time we'll get the four and the zero out. And because it's a zero here, I know I'm done. I just put the four in the next item in the array and then the zero into yet another next item in the array, and I have the entire array reconstituted. I have to do this by hand first, okay, to understand how to do this before I can write the code to do it. Okay, okay, I'm just gonna pause right now and see if there are any questions, because this question is a combination of a few things. One is, I'm just kind of checking whether you still remember C and C++ programming, and hopefully you guys do. And the second thing is, do you understand the concept of a function and the inverse of that function and know how to apply that? And this one does relate to one of the questions in the mapping homework assignment, you know, because it's the nested application of G in order to fold, in this case, a four-dimensional space into a single one-dimensional space. Are we okay so far? Yes? Maybe? Yep. I'm like trying to figure out how this thing works, but so it has, it, so the answer can't be an array of Well, it could be an array of like, 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 like
Because I'm trying to think of it like, say I'm the ray of light, you're dotting the ray, and you're saying, like, this is the ray of light. Mm -hmm. And I guess what I'm trying to say is that, and this is the part that I'm still kind of struggling with, is how is that this is the inverse? There's not going to be sort of two different arrays of detail. Well, G inverse always give you a two tuple back. So it gives you, quote unquote, an array of two items. The question is, what is the significance of the first item, and what is the significance of the second item? Yeah, we are trying to do that. We are trying to reverse you know, GN code so that instead of having an array turn into a single integer, we want to start with a single integer and turn it back into the array. Mm -hmm. that, that array of pieces was the, was the only array that was exposed to N, this G inverse, that, that there's no other, like, and this is the part that I'm still trying to think about, like, there's no other array that you could have. Ah, okay, I see what you're talking about. Okay, so the question is, are there any other arrays that can give me the same result? Okay. So let's 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 stay on that one for a little bit, okay? <clears throat> what is one of the properties of G? What makes it useful? What okay. Let me ask. Okay. The significance of G is it helps us to establish that the cardinality of n times n is the same as the cardinality of n itself. Right? And how does G accomplish that? It's, it has to have certain properties, right? So what properties does it need to have? Right, okay, so in terms of the, the terminology, the properties of a function, which property does it need to have? It needs to, uh, it needs to be a 1-1, one, one, which is bijection, right? So if it's a bijection, it is it has to be an injection in order to be a bijection, right? What about G inverse? What do we know about G inverse in terms of your know, injection, surjection, and bijection? Exactly. So we also know that G inverse is a injection, right? So if it's an injection, it means for the same, you cannot have two values in the domain mapping to the same thing in the codomain. Does that answer your question? The array that you're decoding has to be unique. Every integer that you pass to you know, GD code, okay, you know, once we're done with that, every integer that you pass to it comes up with a unique array of integers. So that's a very interesting question. It's a very good question. But it has, you know, the answer to that question boils down to G, in, G itself is a bijection. G inverse has to be a bijection. But if it's a bijection, it also has to be an injection, which means you know, it has to give you a unique array of characters for every value that you pass to it. So very good. I like the discussion because it's this is help. This is studying. This is basically me being your study buddy because I'm you know, you're bouncing off questions. I'm giving you the partial answer so that you can basically have to finish the thought. All right. So let's work on this one. This is a concrete value, and the question said you, know, you have to numerically solve it, which means you, you better have a calculator with you. Okay. Now, what if you say, okay, I don't have a calculator with me, but I can give you the approach, right? So you can say, so let's say G inverse apply to, in this case, you have 46,050. And what if you say, okay, this resolve to you know, some X and some Y, and then you say if x is non-zero, then you apply g inverse to x and so on. I will count it as partial credit because you know the method. It's just that you don't have a calculator to help you figure out the square root and all that stuff. I will still give you partial credit for this. But you have to tell me what the, where this y is going. You have to say that this y is going to be nums bracket zero. This is the first item in the array. And then you say, you know, once you apply your know, G inverse on X, it will give you, let's say, um, 
V and W, okay? So this W is going to be nums, okay? I know this is awful as an answer, okay? This goes to nums one, and then if V is not zero, then it has to, you have to apply G inverse again. So if you describe that approach and clearly indicate which value, Y goes to num zero, W goes to nums one, and so on, I will count it as a really good partial answer because you're, the only, the only thing that's missing is you do not spell out what is G inverse and carry out the actual calculation, but you understand how to do it. So if you're running out of time, you don't have a calculator, you can still give me a partial answer. If the idea is there, I will still give, give you, know, in this case, substantial your know, partial credit. Yep. No, no, it says you know, numerically solve it, which means you just have to you know, actually calculate um, the individual values. Which means you have to, the, you can derive it <laughs> on the fly you know, in the exam, but my advice is just copy the inverse function already in the notes in the module. Yep. Okay, I can that. So basically we're just trying to reverse engineer that answer that we got, the 46,000. Yeah, what array came up with that? You know, yeah, so when so what array that you pass to G encode ends up having a return value of 46,050. That's basically what it's asking. Yep. I'm thinking in the terms of flow, but I know that not only is there going to be a different number, it might very well be a different function. Yes. Well, okay, so in this case, it's not going to be a different function, you know, because you know, I, you know, I just want to stick with you know, G and G inverse, but it will be a different format of the question. So it, it's not going to be asking you the same thing here. What would be an example, not of the answer that would be on our test, uh -huh. but a similarly different answer? <laughs> uh, I can ask this question in a different way, you know, which means you know, I give you the array and you give me the actual answer. In other words, you know, I can say, okay, this is the algorithm, and the array is you know, two, three, four, and then followed by a null character. What is it going to return? So I can, I can, I can change the direction of the, of the question. So instead of asking, you know, okay, now we have the return value, what array you know, did I use to come up with that number? I can reverse the whole thing and say, okay, this is the array. What is this function going to return? Which is an easier question to answer in that case. It would be probably good to understand recursion. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yep. But it does so dynamically. In other words, you, know, you can give it like a long string, like 20 characters. It will fold it into a single integer. You can also just give it a single value. It will still kind of quote unquote fold it. Not exactly folding, but it will turn it into a single integer. All right. Yep. So we only got about seven minutes left. What do you guys want to do with the remaining seven minutes? I can, okay, I will give you guys some advice, okay? The first thing is don't overdo these things, okay? Because I can guarantee you that these will not be the same quantified expressions. So your idea, the idea is not to overstudy and just memorize what each one means in this particular test. Instead of doing that, you have to know how to read it, okay? How do you interpret it and how do you process it? So that means you know, one of the things you can do is to go through the modules because I have used quantified expressions quite extensively you know, throughout all the modules. So you want to go through those and see if you can get a, a good understanding of the, what those means. So that would be a good way to study, is because I don't want you to overstudy, because some, when, when some people study, they're actually trying to memorize, and that would not be a good strategy in this case. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. Sorry? Kind of address the group. Address the group. Yeah, like all the, all the 
So you want to address your group, yeah, yeah, address yeah. all the students. Yeah, pretty much, like guys, like this class is hard. I've taken a lot of hard classes with differential equations and stuff. This is probably I haven't been the hardest class in the entire program. Uh, I would put my Discord name up on the whiteboard if anyone else want to write stuff with that. Yep, go ahead. And if I've been trying to get a study group going here for a while, and I think that we can't obviously collaborate during the test, but we certainly can collaborate in terms of creating our study materials in our own notes. Mm -hmm. And so my idea is that if we all get together collectively over the next like week or so and create good study materials, that we'll all have a pretty comprehensive set of materials to go into the test. Do you want to write down any contact information? Because uh, otherwise, yeah, people will try to hunt you down in person. No, no, I'm going to put my contact information. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Yep. Yeah, studying together is a good approach, you know, because, you know, uh, one, you know, when so we, okay, people are lazy, okay? That's why we are here, okay? Because our ancestors have been very lazy. <clears throat> So I understand that people want to use the least effort to get the most out of something, okay? That's just natural. So having a group is helpful, you know, because you know, there will be other people to motivate you to go like, hey, let's go study, okay? Let's get on to you know, the material, okay? You know, let's go ahead and try these examples. So it really helps you know, because now you're not alone, okay? You're not just trying to get yourself out of your bed and go like, oh, I have to study. Now you actually have a group of people who are studying with you, so I think it helps in that sense. But I've also seen a lot of um, <clears throat> dysfunctional study groups <laughs> um, where you know, the culture of the group is a little bit toxic, so instead of studying, all they do is to complain about me. Now, I'm not saying that there's nothing to complain about me, okay? You know, there's plenty of stuff that people can complain about me, but none of that is gonna help in the exam, okay? People can complain after the exam, but not in the preparation of the exam, okay? So, so how, you know, how the group function as a whole, you know, is really important. It's good to keep the group focused, you know, on the study material, you know, how to prepare the material, what seems to be important, and, you know, and also quiz each other. You guys can bounce off ideas. It's like, okay, I come up with this expression here, and this is set A, and this is set B. Okay, you guys try to figure out what, is the, what the answer is to this particular question. So you guys can come up with questions. The, the, the process of coming up with a question to ask a peer is one of the best ways to study. Because you'll be exercising all of the concepts you have to come up with the key because the other person may ask, so what is the answer? You have to know what the answer is supposed to be. And then you have a few people to help you go like, no, I think you're wrong. So in case you cannot determine what the right answer is, you can always come to me. You know, we have one week before the exam, okay? I know Monday is a holiday, but I keep, you know, answering email, you know, and stuff like that. So if you guys enter, you know, get into a situation where I re we really don't know as a group, you know, what the answer is, I can always you know, try to help. So very good. Any other questions? Any other points you guys want to share with the rest of the class? Yes. I did not take road today. Um, yeah, just because we got a lot of stuff to talk about, so I'm not going to take road today. So we're good. <clears throat> Anything else? Well, if you guys don't have any questions, you know, we still have three more minutes. I cannot let you go just yet. <laughs> I think my question is, would you take this class online? I mean, I, this is a genuine question, okay, is, you know, would you take this class online with a professor who's better than me who knows how to teach online? So let's, you know, get that aspect of tech out of the equation. Okay, some would and some would not. Okay, so for those who said you know, you would, you know, why would you take this? Why would you not take this class online? Yeah. I think it really depends on like their like the question, their response. Like, does he email on the question? Yeah, that's something that would take like a couple days for response. Yep. 
And then the, the response is, can you clarify your question, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's probably automated. You know, whatever question comes in, I'm just going to ask, can you clarify your question a little bit more? <laughs> um, yeah, I can, I can see that. Um, does the examples in class you know, help in this case? Okay, it does. Okay, so the interaction part helps a little bit. Okay. All right. Well, I do let you guys go a little bit early because it's Valentine's Day. I know you guys have other concerns. <laughs> this is just one of the many concerns. You've got other concerns.